Um, over the next few days, this climate hub will be home to business leaders, policymakers, innovators, and scientists, all working um, hand in hand with the wider community here in Glasgow to debate, to discuss, and to discover climate solutions together. And before this session kicks off and I hand over to my colleague, Hannah Fairfield, I'd like to take a moment to thank Leaps by Bayer, our sponsor for hosting this session. Thank you to our audiences in um, both in Glasgow and for those tuning in around the world. As a reminder, if you are tuning in virtually, please uh, submit your questions to the broadcast. Thank you very much. At a moment when distance has made our worlds and disciplines more siloed, discussions that bring together diverse stakeholders are just so important. I'm grateful to the New York Times for bringing us together in Glasgow and virtually. Collaboration is the only way we will innovate ourselves out of the climate crisis. This is especially true in areas that touch all of us, like food and farming. Leaps by Bayer is tasked to invest in breakthrough technologies with the potential to address 10 huge challenges or leaps. Agriculture today faces a monumental challenge to dramatically increase the quality, diversity, accessibility, and nutrition of the food we grow while reducing the use of land, water, and ultimately its impact on climate change. We see it as our responsibility to rise to these challenges and work together. I'm sure you are as eager as I am to gain insights from this esteemed panel into what's really at stake at COP26. I hope you enjoy the conversation. missing one, are we? Not yet. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Thank you all for joining us in this beautiful space. And thank you, Al Gore, uh, former Vice President of the United States and founder and chairman of the Climate Reality Project. Thank you so much yeah. for our conversation today. Well, thank you for inviting me. And I, I want to agree that this space is beautiful. And I heard backstage that all these uh, plants and trees are being replanted in Scotland after the, uh, after the COP. So as the Australians say, good on you. It is absolutely stunning. So we're going we're gonna to chat um, for about half the time, and then we'll welcome to the stage Janet Ranganathan okay, from great. the World Resources Institute. Yeah. So we're here to talk about data. Um, Al, tell me, what data do we have now? that has emerged as a tool in better understanding global emissions that are warming the planet. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the, the bedrock of modern climate science is the so-called Keeling curve that uh, Roger Revelle uh, uh, envisioned uh, back in 1957. But uh, when you get down to a more granular level, the information we have about where the greenhouse gas emissions are coming from has been, up until recently, uh, based on self-reporting uh, and by the polluters themselves often. There are 100 countries uh, that don't have any emissions data, any more recent than five years old, uh, some 20 years old. Uh, there are huge gaps in emissions. Uh, and um, in September, that changed uh, a new a coalition that I, I've joined with others to launch called Climate Trace. Uh, it's climatetrace.org. You can see the uh, inventory there. Uh, it's a coalition of 12 uh, AI tech companies and NGOs. A and we, we have uh, worked for some time now to collect uh, the data from 300 existing satellites, 11,100 ground-based, air-based, sea-based sensors, and voluminous uh, data streams from the internet. 
uh, fed into purpose-built uh, AI uh, uh, analyses that create algorithms uh, and we can t ground truth them in geographies where that's possible and then apply them in geographies like China, for example, where it's not always possible. Uh, we have just published the first independent, comprehensive, granular, timely inventory that's on climatetrace.org. And there were some surprises in it. Uh, emissions from oil and gas uh, production and refining turns, turn out to be twice as high as was reported. Uh, emissions from rice in India, three times as high as was reported. There are quite a few other examples. That doesn't change the overall total because the Keeling curve uh, still gives us the 414 parts per million. It actually oscillates seasonally and it's as high as 417 parts per million now. Uh, but we now have the emissions uh, for the last five years, including 2020, uh, for, for every large uh, source of greenhouse gas emissions on the planet. We have every power plant, every refinery, every large ship, every plane, uh, many other sources. And by next year, we will have that down to such a granular level that we will be able to report uh, monthly, uh, weekly, and in many cases daily uh, totals from every single significant emission source everywhere in the world. That kind of data can be hard to analyze because it's, it's, it's so big. And sometimes it can be hard to see trends very clearly. So even if countries have the open access, there can still be roadblocks. So what are some of the ways that those roadblocks to analysis and to seeing the trends, what are some ways that that, that can be removed? Well, that's where artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, has become such a, a revolutionary breakthrough. You know, many uh, technology analysts have defined AI as one of the most gigantic uh, advances in the history of technology and, and more, more to come and uh, many people are spending a lot of time on it. But uh, let me give you an example. You can, we, we have several satellite constellations now that do a line scan of the planet every day. Uh, planet Labs, uh, for example, Maxar, there, there, there are others. Um, uh, and they are able to, to, to uh, see every square centimeter of the Earth's surface every day. Uh, and soon they'll be able to see it like every six hours. Uh, now, you can see it in multiple wavelengths if you use different satellite constellations. You can look at a, uh, uh, at a stack coming from a, a methane uh, facility and it, you don't see anything. But if you use an infrared uh, aperture, you can see the methane coming out. Uh, you can also uh, get information from things like the ripples in the river adjacent to a cooling tower. Uh, and over time, you can associate uh, those ripples with a certain amount. But if you take all of those things and other information and fuse it together with machine learning, artificial intelligence, then you can, over time, perfect a, an incredibly accurate algorithm that can tell you with great precision what the emissions are, whether it's CO2 or methane or nitrous oxides. So turning to the contrast between what we know now and where the technology is clearly moving, what are we starting to understand now that has the potential to influence the policy mm -hmm. of the future? Well, there's an old cliche that I'm sure you've heard a million times, uh, you can only manage what you can measure. Uh, and uh, with the ability to accurately measure how much, how many emissions are coming from what location and then determine who is responsible for those emissions, that changes everything. Because then you're not, you're, you're not waiting years to get self-reported data and it's an estimation and it's not accurate. When you have real-time information about exactly where the emissions are coming from and you can attach responsibility for those emissions uh, to an individual a company or a beneficial owner, then think what that does. If investors are making net zero commitments and they're held to the standard, then their ability to know whether a company they're thinking of investing in uh, is 
going up in their emissions or going down matters a lot. If you're a large uh, multinational company with a global supply chain and you've made a, a net zero commitment, uh, then you can identify those uh, principles in your supply chain uh, and identify which ones are contributing to the problem, which ones are contributing to the solution. The NGO and activist community uh, can then zero in on the top 10 emitters this week or however they want to frame it. Uh, and then the, the power of moral suasion is becoming a significant factor uh, because people around the world have uh, had their consciousness raised about the climate crisis. They understand it's getting worse faster than we're deploying the solutions and they're demanding uh, that we act. Governments that in many cases now don't even know where the emissions in their national territory are coming from, all of a sudden they have the ability to determine exactly where they're coming from. And if, if, government, if nation states have made net zero uh, commitments, then now all of a sudden uh, their, their citizenry, uh, the, the large businesses and NGOs in their territories can hold them to account by referring to this uh, emissions data. So my next question, since, um, since we're all here in Glasgow because of COP26, is how do the COPs of the future, COP27, 28, 29, how are they going to make use of these kind of technologies? Well, uh, Patricia Espinosa, who heads uh, this, this current, uh, the UNFCCC, and is in charge of this process, put out a, a glowing statement when we published our first inventory about how valuable it's going to be. Uh, I have, uh, w with, with many others, uh, I've been fascinated by the many sessions I've been able to listen to and participate in. And in so many of them, people talk about uh, net zero or carbon neutrality, and they refer to estimates of uh, what, what was happening last year or five years ago or whatever. Um, and that whole vague process of estimation uh, has now been hacked. Uh, and in future COPs, as this data, as these data streams become ever more granular and ever more timely, then th th you won't have to estimate anymore. You can, you can say with great uh, confidence and accuracy, okay, uh, this industry promised to do X, they're not yet doing it. Uh, and here's where the, the, uh, the laggards are, here's where the problems can be solved. And all of a sudden, with the measurement, you can have management. So yesterday, President Biden had some sharp words for the leaders of China and Russia and said that it was a big mistake for them not to show up mm -hmm. at COP26. So how can this new data monitoring help to bring all countries to the table? Well, as it becomes more widely accepted as the gold standard for where the emissions are coming from, uh, every nation can make use of it. Uh, I was able to give John Kerry an advanced copy of one of our climate trace uh, analyses uh, in, during his first uh, negotiation with Xi Jinping in Shanghai earlier this year, uh, which showed every uh, emissions stream from the coal complex in India. Every, every boiler, uh, every power plant, every boiler, every train, every mine, uh, every truck. Uh, and what the analysis uh, showed was that China could actually save $1.6 trillion over the next 20 years by just shutting down these coal plants. Their, their capacity utilization is often very, very low uh, the co the co pollution of particulate uh, pollution kills nine million people in the world every year. How we've had a blind spot about that for so long is amazing. But it's worst of all in China and in, and India. So when that information at that granular level is available, then it's up to each nation to make choices uh, for themselves. And in in China, for example, there's an ancient. Uh, uh, saying from the old dynasties about uh, the, the mandate of heaven being withdrawn. I mean, the, the winners write the histories, and the new dynasty would say the mandate of heaven w was withdrawn because there was some natural disaster or whatever. I think that my, my impression is that the Communist Party in China 
uh, is extremely uh, attentive to anything that might threaten their hegemony on uh, moral authority and political power in China. And the, the uneasiness about these levels of, of pollution uh, has become a political issue at the grassroots level there. So knowing that you can save money while simultaneously reducing pollution and making your companies more competitive, you know, we're seeing a shift from some facilities from China to, to Vietnam and to uh, uh, Bangladesh and Thailand uh, as, as wage rates naf naturally come up. So when they can become more efficient in the cost of energy uh, and the productivity of their workforce, then that's a, that, that's a good reason uh, for them to accelerate their shift to renewable energy and electric vehicles. I would love to welcome to the stage right now Janet Ranganathan, who's the Vice President for Research, Data, and Innovation at the World Resources Institute. And she's been there for 27 years and has really seen um, a lot of change in data and methodologies. Welcome, Janet. Excuse me for not getting up. So, Janet, this kind of big data that we've been talking about is, is really growing our understanding of a lot of things, climate finance, policy implementation, fiscal tools. In what ways are you seeing that kind of change and, and what's exciting for you? Yeah, so um, it's almost like a, the data revolution is also creating a revolution in how we think about how we can decarbonize. Um, I, I think we were talking a little bit earlier, but I've had I've the luxury of being at the World Resources Institute for almost three decades. And when we started, you know, typical information was, you know, we'd do some research, we'd get it peer reviewed, we'd publish it, we maybe make a thousand copies, get it in the hands of the elite. Well now, you know, today, fast forward, um, you know, we're monitoring forest deforestation in near real time. We're, you know, computing that and analyzing it and we're sharing it with the masses. So it's, it's a profound impact. So, you know, that's one NGO's experience, but you know, the, the field of finance, the field of climate impacts, you know, we have a lot of data to think about how we create resilience and adaptation. All of these things are profoundly impacted by this, this data revolution. Can I give a shout out to WRI? Janet and I had, I had the privilege of working yeah. with Janet. I was on the board at WRI for 10 years before my term uh, forced me to leave and my co-founder of Generation Investment Management, David Blood, is now chair of WRI. Sure. I'd just like to say, I'm biased as you can tell, but I think WRI is the gold standard information utility for, the, for much of the environmental movement in the world, and it's because of dedicated uh, researchers like Janet. And utility is really the, the key word there. So what I'd like to explore a little bit is how this kind of data can be used sure. to drive change. I'd love to give you four examples, four of my favorite examples. Real quick, we can delve into the details if you want. The first one I've just alluded to, Global Forest Watch. It's literally used by thousands of people every day. So it uses satellite information, um, which picks up deforestation across the tropics, 30 meter resolution, and can send alerts out to anyone who signs up for one of those. Um, it's used to protect forests, to protect indigenous people's territories, to source more responsibly, to sustainably manage forests. The first example. Second example, very relevant to COP26. Climate Watch, another very, very favorite project of mine, has data information on emissions, removals, financing from every country in the world. Um, data analysis, benchmarking. It's been used by over 100 national governments to inform how they strengthen the ambition in their nationally declared commitments. Third example, uh, aqueduct, water risk, so globally consistent information sub-basin level on stress, water risk today, as well as projected risk. Companies, thousands of companies use that, both to identify where they've got risks across their global operations, but also to make commitments and take action. So a couple of examples. Cargill recently came out with a commitment to restore watersheds and improve safe drinking water in 25 watersheds across six um, continents. Uh, Microsoft, they made a, a water positive commitment, again using that data. And then the last example, which is also a favorite of mine, is we recognize that a lot of solutions, they're not just about climate, they're about energy, they're about food, they're security. So we also have to be 
get much better at getting data out of their silos and integrating it. So an example of that is we have this platform. It's called Resource Watch. So it takes data from all those other platforms I talked about, but allows the user to easily join up. Let me give you an example of how that data can be used. Um, development banks, uh, fi private banks, they sit on a number of power assets, hydropower assets. So if you want to look at risk of hydropower assets on climate change, you need to know where the power plants are. We talked about that earlier. You need to know how climate is impacting water flows. You need the hydrological risk. You need ownership information. So Resource Watch helps you integrate that data so you can do that. So thank you for that great question. So this, is, this next question is really for both of you. Looking ahead, because we're always looking ahead, where do you see the major data needs for enabling climate solutions? Where are we going? Where are the data needs? Well, uh, we need, I think we need what I was describing earlier, a very accurate and very timely, real-time uh, report on exactly where the greenhouse gas, gas emissions are coming from. I mean, you, you know, we're using the sky as an open sewer. Uh, we're putting 162 million tons every day uh, into the sky. And the sky is not the way it appears when you look up from the ground. It's not a vast and limitless expanse. If you could drive a car straight up in the air, you get to the top of the sky in about five minutes. Uh, and the top of the sky defined as where you can't breathe unassisted anymore defined also as where the, below which uh, all the greenhouse gases are. And, and we're filling that uh, space up, and on average each molecule is there for about 100 years. The real math is very complicated and above my pay grade, but, but do the scientists say about 100 years is a good figure to use. And the accumulated amount now traps as much extra heat as every day as would be released by 600,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs exploding every 24 hours. And that's disrupting the water cycle. Uh, that, that is really radically changing the climate balance, weather patterns, ocean currents, sea, uh, air, air currents, the jet stream. Uh, there's so many examples of this. Uh, and the second order consequences include climate refugees that are now four times larger than all the refugees from wars and conflicts. Uh, and the list goes on, and I'll, I'll spin out of this and say, uh, if the problem is, as, and the problem is all this uh, uh, greenhouse gas pollution being put into the sky, if you want to stop that, if you want to start scaling it down, then the information you need is where is it coming from and who's responsible for generating it? So I'll get on the edge of my chair here because this is the frontier. Let me mention a few things. Um, you know, I've just come from the, the COP conference and, um, you know, it's like, Pledges, pledges, more money, more commitments. So we don't want to have this sort of pledge and go, okay? We have to kind of hold people now accountable for these pledges and delivery. So I think we need to move from, we, we need to expand from thinking about the problem to how do we actually ensure implementation. So that means information on transparency and accountability for monitoring, but it also means information for better decision making. So we need to be thinking about how do we develop these kind of customized apps to help a company that's made a deforestation free supply chain commitment to deliver on that. The second really important area that I, I want to highlight here um, is we need much more data to illuminate climate justice issues um, on equity and inclusion. And this, some of it's going to be about the climate impacts data because we don't even have floodplain maps in many parts of the world. We don't have maps of where informal settlement is. And even on the mitigation side, you know, you know we implement policies to mitigate information. We need information on who's going to get the benefits and who bears the cost, because too often it's the poor that bear the cost of some of these policies and, and, and then the flex. And the last thing I want to mention is today is finance day um, at the COP. So there's a lot of talk, quite rightfully so, about how much finance, you know, the, hun the hundred billion. But we also need to be able to track what finance we have, like where's it going? Who's supplying it? Where's it going? But even more importantly, how's it being used? And who's it reaching? Is it making a difference? And, and if I could add to that, br brilliantly said, um, in addition to just looking at the raw data and asking what more data do we need, 
I think we've reached a stage where we have to reinvent the, the context uh, of the data and revisit some of the assumptions we make about what data is valuable and what data is not. Uh, when we look at these decisions uh, by investors, by companies that are spending their money, um, if, you think of, uh, if you think of the electromagnetic spectrum, forgive the analogy, from the long radio waves to the short gamma waves and the microwaves and everything in between, the portion of that spectrum we can see with our eyes is 0.1% of the spectrum. I spent eight years working in the White House where I started every single day with at least an hour from the Intelligence Committee that collected information from the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And the, and the picture was far more accurate and complete. Now here's the analogy. If you think of the value spectrum, what has value to us? What has value in the economy? What has value to us personally, our families and communities? Too frequently, we look through a very narrow aperture and we see short-term profits for one kind of stakeholder, the owners of the shares or equity shares of companies. But what about the value of the air and the water, the mountains, the ocean? What about the families of that company and the communities where they live and the families and communities in the supply chain? We do not yet have uh, an easily accessible context to place the short-term profits of one stakeholder on the same matrix with all of these other values. And you know, if, uh, if something doesn't have a price tag attached to it, it can seem like it has no value. Uh, and so we have to, to, to reimagine how to integrate the larger part of the value spectrum. Because now when we just focus on that narrow metric, then we, we ignore negative externalities as the economists famously call them, pollution, plastic waste in the ocean, et cetera. We ignore uh, positive externalities, the value of investing in public goods like education and healthcare, environmental protection, pandemic preparedness. Uh, we ignore the depletion of natural resources like topsoil. The FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization says we may have only 60 harvests left with current practices. We'll avoid that, but we don't measure the loss of topsoil or the loss of underground, uh, underground water aquifers. And then finally, we don't measure the distribution of incomes and net worths. So, uh, you know, profits go up uh, and we get much more pollution chronic underinvestment in the things that make our, our lives better, the depletion of the web of living species and the sixth great extinction and topsoil and water, and we get 1% of the world owning 46% of the world's wealth and hyper inequality that's driving populist authoritarianism around the world. So there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Very well said. Um, let me throw something in, certainly not as grand as um, what you've said, but one of the things that makes me a little sleepless at night, many things do, including the time difference. Um, but, but <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we just yesterday did a soft launch of the Land and Carbon Lab. And, you know, the vision there, we're really getting close to it now. We're going to be able to sort of monitor on a regular basis every 10 meter parcel of the entire planet, not just the forest now, which we do quite well but the rest of it as well. Now, you can even look into my backyard and see what the heck I'm doing there and where I got too many invasive weeds. But an organization like WRI, you know, who are producing this data, we've made open data commitments. And I think that's a right thing. And I would say anyone who's funding in this space, public money, financial money, should be asking for that. But, but there's another side to that now. I mean, if we're putting this extraordinarily detailed level of information out there, and it's, it's possible to overlay things like ownership and productivity of land, there may be a downside to that. So I do think that we need to start thinking about protocols for responsible use of data that go, you know, go to this sort of new world of complete radical transparency. Mm -hmm. At this point, I would love to get some questions from our virtual audience. We have lots of people who are watching this online. Um, and I'd like to invite um, our partners uh, 
to be able to give us some questions online. Hello. We hear you. Do you hear me? Yep. Yes, you do. Sorry. Um, yes, thank you for this great discussion. So the first question coming in from online is that using data to monitor forest cover and emissions is excellent, but how do we deal with malpractice found in practices like canceling REDD plus payments uh, that aren't helpful in naming and shaming? Hmm. Okay, I, I always get worried when I hear that but word. <laughs> Um, but I think it gets back to this, this thing that I've talked about, responsible use of data and thinking through some of the implications of how data can be used. I mean, my, our view at w World Resources Institute is that before we start any data initiative, you know, we, we have a laser focus of, you know, what's, <clears throat> what's the problem we're trying to solve? And if it was solved, you know, how does it align with WRI's mission? Because, you know, we, need, we can't do everything. And that sort of, that, that, that requires us to unpack the issue of, well, who could actually help us do something about that problem if they were informed with data? And what would motivate them to use that data? And could that data be used with unintended consequences, such as the, the question one here talks about? Um, so, so we go through those questions, and we also have to ask ourselves that when we put this out, and we usually have to build it with the people that we want to use the data, that's one of the lessons we've learned, you know, be totally user-centric, is to then go back and evaluate afterwards whether you actually got the intended result, because often you don't, or there'll be unintended consequences. So I think that's part of this sort of data interaction chain responsibility to avoid the kind of things that you've just talked about there. Thank you. I'll invite a second question from our online audience. Group. Okay, one more. Do you see this reimagining of the value spectrum as being driven by regulatory pressure or governmental action, or do you think it's ultimately up to the private sector and investors to drive this paradigm shift? I think both sectors have an important role to play. Ultimately, governments will have to be involved. Uh, the, the full integration of ESG values into the investment marketplace has been primarily a private sector mission. Uh, but uh, there is a lack of standards. There's a lack of, uh, uh, of accountability. One of the most significant announcements uh, that has been made at this COP was one that passed without sufficient uh, attention, and that was Secretary uh, General Antonio Guterres. Uh, he said several things in what I thought was a brilliant opening statement. But one of the things he said was that uh, he intends to stand up a new UN-based institution to monitor and report on the integrity of non-state actors pledges to reach net zero. There are so many different varied standards out there, and uh, it, it, it's not with evil intent. There are a lot of people that feel like it's the right thing to do, and they're going to do it, and uh, some of us are really doing it in, in what I think is the right way to do it. But if, if the UN does a good job of, of continually monitoring and reporting on the integrity of these commitments, and whether these commitments are being kept or not, that is an example of how to uh, uh, respect that larger uh, value chain that I referred to uh, earlier. But civil society uh, has a very important role to play uh, as well. And uh, some of the many groups that are here in force uh, in Glasgow are, are very eager to play their role in making sure that we monitor that. So um, I love the question, and I would say yes, all of those and some more, okay? And that includes all of you sitting in the audience. You know, what can you do about this problem? You know, where are you investing your money? Where are you doing your shopping? Where's your, you know, your pension plan invested? What's your elected officials? What do you know about their policies on these issues? So I always think of sustainability as a team sport. So yes, it's all of those and, and some more. And um, I'm a big fan of I'm a big fan of geospatial data, I admit that. You know, I always believe what gets mapped gets managed, or as Albert Einstein once said, you know, to discover a new world, you need new maps. <laughs> and um, to actually recover this world, we're gonna need new data, new maps, and actually a lot of it's there. We just need to unleash the creativity around it to drive the action we need. I, I wanna throw out a quote also at this point. <laughs> Nelson Mandela said, it always seems impossible until it's, it's done. done. 
I would also love to invite questions from our live audience. Um, we will have, I think, some folks with microphones. Um, why don't we take three um, together now, if that's, if that's possible. Hi there, thank you. Um, Laura Kelly from The Big Issue magazine. I was really glad to hear you talk about equality. I wonder, is a more equitable distribution of economic resource inextricably linked to a sustainable future? I think, I think it is, yes. I, I had a, a, a great friend who was the former president of Bolivia, Gonzalo Sanchez de Lozada, and he once said to me, he was an economist by training and a, and a very good president, um, long ago. He once said that um, inequality, Al, is like um, inflation. Uh, a little bit uh, it can be a good thing, but you want to avoid the hyper variety at all costs. Um, you know, uh, in, some inequality is inherent uh, in uh, human nature uh, and contributes to the uh, ubiquitous organic incentives that unlock uh, uh, a higher fraction of human potential. I do believe that capitalism is the best way of organizing uh, economic activity if it's done with integrity. Uh, it, it balances supply and demand and allocates resources and uh, rewards incentive and uh, uh, ingenuity and hard work. Um, and the alternatives explored in the 20th century didn't work out too well. And, and yet, the, the hyper-inequality that I referred to earlier is only one of the, the real problems with our current version of capitalism, and we need to reform it, uh, very much so. Uh, and the hegemonic um, ideology in our, in our world, particularly after the fall of the Berlin Wall, was a, a compound uh, ideology, democratic capitalism. But uh, both are now under stress. Uh, our, our democracy has been upended by algorithms on social media and uh, agenda-driven uh, broadcasters, and uh, it, it, it needs uh, attention. There are ways to solve it. But that bleeds over into the design of our current market economics. And you see the use of of economic wealth and political power to twist uh, the tax laws uh, and the very fact that here we are in this climate crisis and the tax laws are subsidizing the, the production and burning of more and more fossil fuels. For all the pledges to, for climate finance, for renewals, uh, the financial institutions and governments are giving way more money still to, to explore for, uh, find, de, de, produce, develop, and burn more and more fossil fuels. It is quite literally insane. Uh, and so, and that is connected to the, the hyper inequality because those who gain the benefits from that often find ways to use them to lock in place the, the policies and the laws that use the revolving door and lobbyists and campaign contributions. You know, two days ago, the Federal Election Commission in the United States made a decision that is perfectly all right for foreign entities outside the United States to spend unlimited amounts of money on election referenda campaigns in the U.S., including on uh, congressional redistricting. Why? Why? Do we want our democracy to be used as a chew toy? for whoever wants to uh, cripple the United States of America. And we're not the only country in this uh, position. Some of the newly emergent uh, democracies in the former uh, Soviet states uh, are experiencing the same thing. Uh, and often, more often than not, what's behind the manipulation is the relentless desire for those who have the wealth and power to keep it and to stop any effort uh, to, to uh, to have a more equal uh, distribution. The word distribution sounds like a, you, you know, a government mandated thing, but, the, but distribution is an organic result of the laws that are in place and the policies that, that are in place. And if our ability as free citizens to modify and change and adapt the policies that, uh, that we use to govern ourselves, if that's crippled, 
And if that remains in control of the people who benefit from the current inequitable result, then what you get is a, is, is a violation. Here we are in the home of the Scottish Enlightenment. John Locke famously said, all just power is derived from the consent of the governed. If the governed feel like they have no means of giving their consent to the policies that are governing their lives, then that's not a good place in which we find ourselves. Uh, so we need some serious reform uh, to solve the climate crisis, we've got to solve the democracy crisis, and we've got to reform the, the tenets of the current version of capitalism. That's a big agenda, but I'll tell you what, we've got no choice but to take it on. And I look at the young people out in the streets here, and I, I have a feeling uh, that there's a good appetite for some big changes. I think with that, unfortunately, though, I'd like to take another question from the audience. I think we are at time. This has been an amazing conversation. Thank you so much, Al and Janet. And thank you, audience, for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Janet.